Now, it may come as a surprise to those of you who know me, but this happens to be the first time I have ever in a conference given a presentation about the Icelandic crisis. Now, it would be a surprise because I have written a number of papers about this. I talked to millions of journalists from all over the world about this, but like I said, this is, I have successfully until now refused every invitation to present a paper. However, I had to come over here and I said, if this is the price I have to pay to come to Korea, I'll pay the price. <laughs> now, that said, it actually turned out to be quite good because I've been sitting thinking about this, what am I going to say for the past few months? And the way I solved the problem was I had a nagging parallel problem at the, at the back of my mind. What about problems within the EU, problems, well, I mentioned Greece and driver's licenses a few, in a few minutes. And so I started, we start, I got together some colleagues who know about this stuff and we started writing exactly this paper. Now, the paper in your folder was written over a year ago with one of the guys there, the, the last co-author. And we had hoped to have a new paper out by the time of the conference. However, this ran into a little bit of difficulty because of the middle co-author. And this is worthwhile talking about her a little bit. Now, after the economy of Iceland collapsed and all the corruption they discovered and all the theft and all the abuse that went on, the parliament appointed a committee. Now, of course, everybody expected this to be a complete whitewash, as it always is, no conclusion, but they actually did serious work. And she was just about the only economist they could find in Iceland who was not implicated. And the reason is everybody there had been bought. If, if you were a serious economist, you were paid by the government or paid by the banks. Everybody. So since this is Yale, she was not bought. Well, she was put on the committee. She did a very good job. Problem is, they got they were late delivering the report, so she's just unwinding and uh, behind her contributions. So the paper didn't get finished. We are hoping, and we have promised economic policy to deliver a paper on this in in a few weeks. So there will be, I really hope, a paper on my website within two or three weeks on this. You, you never quite know. In any case. This is about the danger of integration, dangers of integration, because I am, and this is a topic that has unexpectedly become relevant. Now, of course, those of you living in Korea, of course, you would not imagine that such a problem exists. Because you live in Korea, you are a completely, utterly independent country, managing business with large countries around you. So it's basically geopolitics. In Europe, it's different. Now, a little bit of a background, and, and I apologize to the, to the people who know this depressingly well. The reason why we had the European Union is because of the political mission of never having another war in, the, in the Europe. So Europe, the European Union is a political entity to prevent wars. It started in the 1950s, and the idea was if you make countries exposed to each other, now this is, by the way, what is called global imbalances, which is called bad, but within Europe, global imbalances were good because you want people to be, to be exposed to each other. That's a political mission. The idea is if companies are operating across Europe, if people go across Europe, you are less likely to end up with a war. Now, this sort of proceeds, right, but it's important because the mission of Europe is political first, economic second. Now, it is, the economics is not that important. So, however, of course, they realized that the integration really means economic integration. Now, politically, this means you need to have harmonization in regulation. Because you don't want a country to be able to, if you have different regulations, you can get protectionism. And that goes, that goes contrary to the political mission. Now this means the supervisors, the guys enforcing the regulations, they must not be allowed to selectively enforce regulations to protect home countries. So this means, in the European interpretation, you end up 
with supervision being done at home. And I'm going to do this within the financial sector on the next slide. Now, there's no problem with this as such. A big country like the US does this quite effectively. The only problem is the Europe is trying to do this without a center budgetary and political power. So it's in effect a grouping of countries with a very loose confederation and they're trying to do something the United States has managed, but very few other places have managed, but you need without. And that's exactly is the failure, I think, of the European project in financial services and the failure represented by the euro. So and this is, of course, something we've been discussing quite a lot here in the, in, in the corridors. Now, within the financial services, you have what is called the European passport. Now, a European passport means a financial institution in one country, say Iceland, can operate in any other European country as if they were from that country. Now, the regulations in Europe are Basel II, Basel I, Basel II plus European stuff. Europe regulations are by and large Europe-wide and Europe-designed. However, however, the problem is the supervision is done by the home country. Now, the, the language is such, you have a home country and a host country. Bank from Iceland, the home country is Iceland, it operates in the UK, the host country is the UK. And the problem is, if the home country can lack the abilities to supervise, the home country can be corrupt, it can be incompetent, it can be any number of things, and because of the political and economic mission of Europe, there is, you can't bypass that. And the, in the interest of such, it's very difficult to go beyond the political in this. So, now, in the case that we are about to talk about, the home country is the only country that has overview. If I decide as a bank and country in one country to do something really damaging, all I need to do is to split my operations up in multiple countries so that the operation in each country is small, but in aggregate they are dangerous. And today there is no mechanism to monitor this except in the home country. No, this is changing and I will talk about this. Now, when this was set up almost 20 years ago, there were worries. And I talked to some of the people who were involved with this, and they might say, for example, what if a bank in Portugal wants to operate in Germany? Where as the assumption is Portugal is a weak country, Germany is a strong country, how can we prevent it? Well, there were strong interests in favor of just going with the system as it's set up, because the idea was a bank in Germany, UK, or the Netherlands, they are the big banking countries, they are going to expand to the weak members, the weak members will not expand to the strong members. And indeed, I mean, the only change on the European banking landscape has been the emergence of Spain, and Spain has turned out to be a very good citizen in this. Now, talk about history. The European countries uh, have had at least two or three hundred years of history of very close cooperation in banking regulation. I mean, if you look at the history, you have banking crisis called international liquidity crisis, which you might think of something in this crisis. There's an example from 1764 of an international liquidity crisis, and with cooperation among financial centers. Even when they were had a wars between them, the markets functioned, which I think is beautiful, by the way. Now, but the idea really was weak countries would not expand to a big country, regardless. Now, however, the internal problem with this is something common in a lot of other policy areas. Now, the, in, the, in the case of the Euro and Greece, this is, of course, something depressingly familiar, but say if we can take it slightly closer to Korea and talk about the Basel II process. The Basel II is really, re, you, the Basel Committee was represented by the biggest banking nations in the world in, in, in 1974. Right, so the, there been no, uh, then only, the only addition to membership was Spain for particular reasons, but now it got expanded last year. Problem is, of course, is that 
when you have a process like that and countries grow at a different rate, some, some advance, some go back, some are corrupt, some are not corrupt, you end up having a system of regulations designed for a particular set of countries being expected to operate across countries who are very different. Now, this is the, one of the fundamental failures of the Basel II process, which, of course, now is, has been, we've been trying to fix. Member states are asymmetric, macroeconomic developments, sophistication, and competence, and corruption. And, of course, I mean, the first, if you take the euro, Greece is probably about to become the, is again going to become an emerging market country. Because it's, I mean, it's, we, we, now, of course, they, like I say, just, just to repeat the point, they expected with the passport that the banks in the large countries with these trusted supervisors, they would really be the guy ex guys expanding. What about, do some background on Iceland, how they come into it. It's not a member of the EU, but it's a member of the econ European Economic Area. This is a very special entity designed for countries that the EU wants, but they don't want to be in the EU. So there are only three countries, Iceland, Luxembourg, uh, Iceland, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. All very rich. Now we look at the per capita GDP in Iceland. It starts being below uh, Germany and the US, and it ends up becoming the second richest country in the world three years ago. And these rapid growth in per capita GDP exceeding $65,000 is directly on the back of the banking bubble I'm about to show you. And you see this big drop there. What's happening is they're ending, they started being the second richest country in the world and they're going to end up being like the Netherlands around the 20th. So they're coming out of this quite well. And now the economy is growing again, so, so, so this is probably uptick if you saw the rec most recent numbers. Now, assets of the three largest banks in Iceland until they all went bust. So they basically grew from being half the economy into being 12 times the economy. So the economy is 2008, after the crisis happened, 12 billion euros. The banks had 120 billion euros. So this is just about the largest known case of bank assets to GDP in the world ever, with some, ex some examples. You could do Luxembourg as an example, but they are a special case for reasons I could explain if you want to. So this expansion has been quite extraordinary. Now, why is this? Well, effectively, was it, it was a Ponzi game. The banks got privatized and deregulated about close to 10 years ago. I'll talk to that in a few slides. Because the Icelandic government had AAA or AA credit rating, it's a bit complicated, but the way the Scandinavian countries do, they pool borrowing. So the, the, therefore, they, they, because they pool borrowing, they are able to get a AAA credit rating. This is, this is roughly how, how that helps them. Banks. In, the banks inherited the government's credit rating. Anybody, this is around 2000. Anybody investing and borrowing and leveraging in the year 2000 made money. You had to be really, really bad not to, not to, not to benefit from leverage if you started in the year 2000. And that's exactly what these guys did. Now, however, they started running into trouble in 2005, 2006, um, some of you may remember there was a carry trade crisis which originated in Iceland in February 2005. which spread to countries like, uh, I was in Argentina, spread there to New Zealand, to Hungary, because of, of hedge funds being exposed to multiple countries, and that this is how the carry trade crisis spills from one country to another. As a consequence of that, the Europeans broadly stopped lending them, and the Americans decided to lend them instead, which means that the biggest creditor is Citibank. To the, and they lost probably $8 billion to Iceland, I believe. Now, so they started borrowing in the US, and however, by 2007, and this is, bef this is starting before the global crisis, 
these guys are effectively increasingly being shut out of the global markets. Again, this is happening prior to the global crisis. They result to this by either securitized funding or um, by what is called the, the foreign deposits. I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, but this is part of the European passport. A bank in one country can raise deposits in another country unregulated, effectively. And thus, the banks replaced informed bank money with depositors' money, <coughs> which is, of course, in the end, of course, in the end, this was like a Ponzi game. They were borrowing to repay loans, and and with debt increasing continually throughout the whole process. The annual asset growth was about 50, 50 to 60 percent of these three banks. So quite, uh, like I said, quite substantial. Now, the banks got privatized up almost 10 years ago. Before the privatization, the political parties ran the banks. The auction was rigged, and they made sure each political party got one bank, effectively. The, this, and, of course, the same political parties controlled the media, so you ended up with two or three groups, the media, the television stations, the newspapers, the magazines, the banks, the supermarket, the food process, everybody belonged to a couple of groups, all politically connected, all making sure there's no dissident. If you try to, if you are an econ this is why, what I said about the economists, if you try to write a newspaper article as saying the system is unstable in 2005, I promise you, you would lose all consulting money from everybody. I know of cases where you write an article against Bank A, you're a university department. The, the, the head of Bank B calls you, calls the head of the department and says, you guys, one of your employees wrote an article in a newspaper. I'm going to take your money away. So the, this was cross-enforced across uh, groups. This means there's no dissident. Uh, the banks manipulated Basel II and Basel I. And there's a well-known case, again documented in the investigation committee, where the banks bought, own, bought their own capital. Now, of course, I mean, banks' capital is meant to be, I want to raise capital, I sell equity to third parties. Well, the way they bypass that is, Bank A would sell capital to Bank B, but enter into a derivatives agreement so that the Bank A would cover all the, all the net lo and lo all la losses and get all the gains. So the banks are able to buy their own equity via derivatives agreements. Now, you will ask, you will want to where the supervisor was, I'll tell you on the next slide. The banks, they, they, they got into the business of lending the money to their own employees, buying their own stock. This was illegal, they did it for about two years. The supervisor told them to stop, stop it. So Bank B would lend money to employees of Bank A to buy stock in Bank A, and vice versa. Again, equally wrong, but that was allowed. In the end, when the banks went bust, they got lending of last resort. The lending of last resort was so extensive that the Bank of Iceland got went, went bankrupt, had to be bailed out by the government. What did the banks do with the lending of last resort? They re-lent it to companies uh, linked to the owners. So the, the LOLR was not used for its purpose, it was used to channel money into other activities. Now, the supervisor was com almost completely unstaffed, with no experience. They did not enforce the available legal remedies at the disposal. They had the ability to limit, to control equity, asset, exp asset exposures, etc., etc. They chose not to. The, they had the ability to oversee international operations. They chose not to. Now, Remember, now you start seeing the failure of the European passport directly there. The Central Bank of Iceland equally weak, besides going bust. The, uh, for, they, almost, they, they strenuously resisted raising reserves. So they said, no, we don't need reserves. We're an advanced country. So reserves were negligible. 
At the same time, the foreign, short-term foreign liabilities of the economy grew to 16, 16 times the reserves. This, of course, directly undermines the confidence in the financial system. So when the run happened, it happened quickly. The, they, they actually encouraged carry trades, which, which I, is, to this day I still don't understand. The carry trades, the money in carry trades eventually amounted to 40% of the economy. And for that, was the, that's, that's the reason why the IMF ordered them to impose capital controls. By the way, the, the talking about the IMF ever slightly, the guy that ran the disastrous uh, IMF operation in Iceland is now running the IMF operation in Greece. I say, God help them. The, the, I have, the, they have been so disastrous as an organization, it's beyond funny. Now, and of course, domestic agents were borrowing in foreign currency. If you go on a car loan, you had two choices. You could go and borrow money in Iceland, paying 15% interest, or borrow in yen, paying 1%. So car loans, mortgages, everything was in foreign currency. Now the question is, what are they going to do about it? And I think the solution will be foreign creditors will take that hit as well, which is, uh, sort of might be happening. Now, deposit insurance fund backing all of this, and I'm going to about to talk about the next slide, it was un again unfunded. There was a full run on the economy in beginning, uh, early 2008. However, they were able to resist, but it was clear then to everybody that the government and the banks had become the same. Now, why were they able to resist? Uh, the run by the foreign creditors, creditor banks, succeeded. But the run by foreign depositors did not happen until uh, three months later. Now, they, there was overwhelming evidence of a collapse. The, we now know the discussions held with foreign governments, and foreign governments almost all refused to provide assistance. And I think that was, that was a correct action, because the government had to be forced to recognize their failures but they decided to gamble for resurrection. Now, what about the European passport? Well, the local supervisor is the only supervisor who knows what the banks are up to. The hosts were, they were either unaware, but they weren't interested. I had a, I had a conversation with, with some of the host supervisors, and they did not realize, or they chose not to be informed about what was going on until it was too late. So, the, again, this is something they are now remedying. Now, when the banks were unable to borrow in the interbank markets and had the highest CDS rate spreads in the world, 10%, 15%, that's when they started raising money in abroad by deposits. And I'm going to talk about that a, on the next slide. One example is the second largest banks, they started raising high interest deposits in the UK in 2006. How does it work? You see an advertisement saying, this bank, offer, I save, op offers you 7.5% interest. If I go to Barclays or HSBC, I get 5%. So, of course, a lot of money was flowing into that. Now, those with access to Google, they could have figured out that this was not as safe, but again, people, did, people chose to pour money into this, again, for reasons slightly beyond me, but that's a different thing. By April 2008, they had 4 billion euros in the UK. The FSA, now through remedies, which probably were not completely legal, told them to stop raising deposits in the UK. Now, why not completely legal? Because the FSA does not have the power to prevent this. It's only the home regulator. So the FSA was, FSA was able to do it through means which my understand are dubious at best, at, at best legally. Now, but they told them to stop raising deposits. They tried to go to other countries. Now, Bank de France, as a, as a well-known case, they said, of course, you're allowed to operate here, but we need to process the application. So Bank de France sat on the application for the longest time. Bank of Spain did the same, Bank of Italy did the same. 
Bundesbank, uh, the uh, BaFin in Germany allowed them to operate. The Dutch said, ah, the law says you can open, open. With, uh, realizing that they had CDS spreads exceeding 10%. So by the time they collapsed, the CDS spreads exceeded 30%. By the way, this in my country, the UK, the, the government commission, government agency, tasked with advising the government on how to invest, they lost uh, a few hundred million pounds on this. So it's a government agency which has a job of advising other government agencies on where to put the money. They put money into that. The local governments, charities lost probably close to two billion pounds on this. Again, this is slightly and they, they will not get a penny back because of the prioritization of claims. Now, problem is, in this, the European Union provides for minimum deposit insurance of 21,000 euros. That's about $25,000. Some governments provide more. UK is unlimited, Netherlands 100,000. However, even if you provide unlimited deposit insurance, you cannot exercise control. So this is again slightly strange that, why, that you can operate, a bank can basically raise deposits without being insured by somebody who cannot control the insurance. In the end, the, I say might cost the government of Iceland 40% of GDP. In the end, we, we might, we'll, we'll know in a few years' time. Conclusion. I think this demonstrates the flaws in the European common market, in the European passport system. The Europe needs either to give more power to the host regulators, again inviting protectionism and all the type that comes with it, or have pan-European supervision, which is now being discussed, but it is running into problems of common budget, etc. Again, the EU deposit insurance system is flawed. They need to clarify the objection of obligation of the government, and deposit insurance should be a national currency, not the euro. Now, we can continue, but I'm out of time. <laughs>